Welcome, welcome, one and all. A pleasure to have you all with us. Thank you so much for uh, joining us this lovely uh, Sunday afternoon. Uh, this remains the highlight of my week. I have uh, disabled wine school purgatory. Um, I have hit record. Um, I'm sure I will find another way um, to uh, take this uh, wine school experience off the rails for you. But um, at the very least, uh, those two things are um, up and uh, Heather, uh, thank, you for, thank you for joining us. Allegra, you unmuted. Uh, congratulations on your new gig. Um, we have yet another uh, former uh, staff member of ours uh, living out my dream courageously um, and getting uh, a job working harvest at, at, a, at a winery. So um, thank you uh, for all of um, your labor, um, for your steadfastness throughout this crisis, and thank you for giving me something to uh, live vicariously through, because Lord knows I would love um, to give this all up and uh, work on a winery right now, but um, I am uh, in the Tail of Goat office uh, hosting uh, this lesson dedicated to uh, Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, with me, as always, is uh, one Zoe Nystrom. Say hello to the people, Zoe. Hey, everyone. Um, this, this lesson inspired by Zoe, um, uh, who uh, called for Sauvignon Blanc, um, who, uh, you know, called it a, uh, a slutty little summer wine. Um, and, you know, the notion of sluttiness vis-a-vis -vis wine, you know, hopefully not too controversial. Um, you know, we're just speaking to a certain forwardness, a precociousness, if you will, um, that is a bit of a love or hate thing when it comes to Sauvignon Blanc. We don't want to demean anyone for their love of Savi B. Um, you know, in this moment, especially, I want to reiterate, there is no such thing as a guilty pleasure. All pleasures are pleasures. I don't care, you know, if you're enjoying a reality TV show while eating Cheetos, you know, off, um, you know, your stomach, you know, that is, you know, a worthwhile uh, way to spend an afternoon uh, in as much as, you know, uh, you know, uh, reading, you know, Ulysses or, or what have you. So um, I think we are in a, a very special moment where we shouldn't be judging ourselves, least of all, uh, for what we love. Uh, my wife has discovered that I have um, a strange uh, uh, love of hoppy IPAs in moments of weakness, uh, and she abhors them. Um, but I'm not beating myself up about my love of hoppy IPAs, which are kind of like the New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc of the beer world, just to bring this all full circle. Um, we offered fully six wines um, for this lesson. I have two of them here. Um, there's no wrong way, there's no wrong order in which to enjoy them. Uh, we're gonna start with the Sancerre for the sake of class and move on to the um, uh, new kind of upstart, the Marlboro uh, Savi B thereafter. Um, and you know, that's just because, you know, we are um, you know, kind of tracing uh, the origins of this grape and, and charting its path from old world uh, to new. But, you know, part of the reason we do this um, comparative tasting is that, you know, tasting one wine against the other illuminates things about each wine. And, you know, I encourage you all to move back and forth, you know, whether you're tasting for the Sauvignon Blancs or, or other wines in our series, um, you know, don't, don't get too hung up about the, the order. Um, you know, I think it's, it's really, um, you know, eye-opening to, to go back and forth between these wines and, you know, tasting one and then tasting the other, even if they're vastly divergent, um, will, will teach you a lot uh, about them. Um, so, you know, um, just have fun uh, with this one. There is no wrong way to drink wine. There is particularly no wrong way to drink uh, Sauvignon Blanc. You know, if you're enjoying your Sauvignon B out of a solo cup, good on you. Uh, we have proper stemware, you know, whatever uh, moves you. Uh, mazel tov. Um, all right, uh, there is no waiting room. Uh, welcome one and all, we're gonna kick this off. Um, it's a pleasure to have you with us uh, for Savi B Week uh, here at Tail Up Goat uh, Wine School. A special thanks to all of you uh, who continue uh, to make this a wonderfully worthwhile uh, endeavor going on our, our 18th week, um, you know, in as much as, um, you know, I hope um, that, you know, this is a, a pleasant diversion for you all. Um, you all have been, um, you know, a, a continual inspiration uh, for me, uh, for um, all of us who work at, at Tail Up Goat, and I thank you for that. Uh, special thanks to uh, Mr. Dennis Abrams today, if you're out there. Uh, we totally uh, fucked up Dennis's order um, and sent him six wines that he'd already had um, instead of the two wines that uh, he's hopefully enjoying now for the sake of this lesson. And um, Dennis uh, courageously offered to buy those wines off of us. Um, and, you know, there have been a million uh, small acts of kindness uh, like that that have, uh, you know, sustained us throughout um, this 
um, you know, uh, crisis um, for, for our industry. Um, I don't want to pretend that, you know, others you know, don't have it way worse, but um, thank you all um, for uh, those uh, small acts of kindness. Um, you know, they continue uh, to sustain us all. Um, without further ado, a bit of verse for you. Uh, this is from a friend of the wine school, John Thompson, um, one of the kindest souls I know, um, and uh, proprietor of an amazing rare books uh, library who uh, continues to text me poems in the midst of pandemic, and I am uh, equally grateful for that. Um, this is from uh, Louise Bogan. Uh, it is called Two Wine. Cup, ignorant and cruel, take from mandate love. It's urgency to prove unfaithful renewal. Take from the wind its loss. The litless dead that lie face upward in the earth. Strong hand and slender thigh. Return to the vein all that is worth grief. Give that beat again. Um, and I, I really uh, love that notion of, you know, things that are worth mourning. Uh, you know, we grieve because we love. There is no grief without love uh, in the first place. Um, and, you know, uh, that, you know, is, is worth celebrating. And uh, Sauvignon Blanc, uh, equally, uh, you know, uh, worth uh, celebrating. Um, we're going to dive right into tasting. I feel like often you have to put up with like 15 me minutes of, of me, you know, going on about, you know, the history of a particular country, the history of a varietal. And, you know, finally, I unleash the, you know, now it's time to taste the wine. Uh, we're we're going to, you know, uh, try to, you know, skip forward uh, for the for the sake of this lesson, I always envision the uh, old men um, in the balcony, um, you know, like uh, in the Muppets, you know, shouting at me, you know, enough about the wine. Let's just taste it already. Um, but I'm, I'm going to keep that short today. I did want to open up with a bit of uh, prose. Uh, Savi B has uh, its champions, its distractors, um, and uh, it has inspired quite a bit of uh, very florid uh, writing. Um, I'm going to kick it off with. Uh, Mr. Oz Clark, who celebrates uh, Sauvignon Blanc in his book, um, uh, Grapes and, and Wines, which is a well worth a read. Not the most comprehensive, um, you know, kind of uh, reference work of all time, but the rare reference work that you can actually read through. Uh, he's a very gifted writer, but he says, why on earth does everyone make such a goddamn fuss about Sauvignon Blanc? Why can't they let it be? After all, it's such a simple grape, isn't it? The wine's not complex. It's not intellectually challenging. It's just a cracking good drink. You get a bottle, you whack it in the chiller, you whip off the screw cap, slosh it in everybody's glass, and hey, crisp, pure, tangy, thirst quenching, yum. What a drink, and I mean drink. A good glass of Sauvignon Blanc is like a good gin and tonic or a good chilled pint of gold nail. Just drink it. That's what it's there for. Um, I, I love that. I love you know, we are, you know, coming up with all sorts of analogies for Savi B. I love the, the gin and tonic of wines. Um, that's, that's amazing to me. Um, just for the point counterpoint, um, representing the nerdy, um, you know, kind of highfalutin wine establishment, uh, Slate.com's former critic, uh, Mike Steinberger, who penned um, a, an article in the aughts uh, called White Lies, Why Sauvignon Blanc is Overrated, that is still archived to this day because, um, you know, a lot of nerdy, you know, wine, people like myself, you know, said, right on, man, you know, this is an overrated grape. Um, you know, we should be contrarian and, you know, uh, try to diminish this thing that's, you know, um, hugely popular. Uh, but uh, Mike says, there was nothing wrong. He's, he's speaking about a, a, a glass of Kim Crawford, uh, Marlboro, uh, Sauvignon Blanc, that he uh, was served at a restaurant. There was nothing wrong with the wine per se. It wasn't cooked, corked, or otherwise spoiled. In fact, it was clean, crisp, and effusively fruity. It was also thoroughly, maddeningly dull, a wine with absolutely nothing to say. This wasn't a Kim Crawford problem, and it wasn't a New Zealand problem. It was a varietal problem. It was a Sauvignon Blanc problem. Simply put, the grape is a dud, hot take, producing chirpy little wines, wholly devoid, complexity and depth, the very qualities that make wine interesting and worth savoring. Uh, for years, this offensively inoffensive grape has escaped criticism. While Chardonnay and Merlot have been scorned, the free ride ends here, declares Mike uh, Steinberger, um, circa like 2006, 2008, um, what have you. Anyway, um, I think like any grape that inspires this level of, um, you know, divisiveness is, is definitely worth a class. Um, and, um, you know, uh, Sauvignon Blanc is a, a hugely interesting uh, topic of uh, study. Um, from whence did it derive? Uh, in the first place. It's a very old varietal, uh, probably descended from the ancient grape Sauvignon, 
uh, which makes it um, uh, related, uh, kin to Gruner Veltliner, Chenin Blanc, Verdejo, uh, uh, Silvaner, among others. Um, the verdict is out um, as to whether it definitely originated in France. Uh, the verdict is out as to whether it originated uh, in uh, Bordeaux or in the Loire. Um, I think there's a, a growing body of evidence to indicate that it originated in the southwest closer to um, Bordeaux, but um, it has certainly reached its apotheosis uh, in the Loire in Sancerre, which we are going to taste uh, momentarily. Um, Sancerre is a variety, or, or Sauvignon Blanc is a varietal wine, didn't really enter the fore um, until after World War II. Historically, Sancerre in particular uh, was a Pinot Noir region, um, and Sauvignon Blanc just happened to be easier to replant after Phylloxera in the late 19th century. Uh, Sabi B, um, you know, entered uh, modern consciousness first as the parent of Sauvignon Blanc. So in the 1750s, um, it spontaneously crossed with Sauvignon Blanc and gave us Cabernet Sauvignon, um, which is why um, Cab Sauv has a lot of the same kind of green pepper notes uh, that Sabi B has. And um, Carol Meredith at uh, UC Davis did really pioneering work um, to establish this genetic relationship. Um, uh, and um, really kind of like revolutionized this field of what's called ampelography um, with this discovery that uh, a white grape could give birth to a uh, red progeny, um, which is, you know, hugely fascinating uh, in its own way. Um, Sauvignon Blanc still plays a role in Bordeaux Blanc, which remains a hugely underrated wine. We saw a couple um, wonderful examples at our own wine store, shameless cross promotion. Uh, but uh, typically, uh, Sauvignon Blanc isn't a standalone entity there. Um, uh, the... Uh, merchants of Bordeaux, the winemakers of Bordeaux, use Semillon to give it um, uh, breadth and to kind of uh, soften it. As a single variety wine, varietal wine, um, it uh, comes to the fore in uh, the Loire Valley. And uh, we are going to talk uh, Sancerre here um, uh, first and foremost. And uh, we have a Sancerre um, from uh, La Verge. Um, uh, Christian and Kevin, uh, an adorable couple, uh, they both are uh, descended from generations of uh, grape uh, growers uh, and winemakers, but only in the recent generation um, did they uh, start to uh, produce their own. Um, uh, it should be said that uh, Sancerre, uh, the Loire Valley, broadly speaking, is not really um, uh, one region so much as it is, um, you know, typically kind of three. You have uh, three or four. You have Pinante, then you have Anjou, which is Muscadet country. You have anjou Tourant, um, which is uh, Chenin Blanc country on the white side, um, Cab Franc country on the red side, and then you have uh, Paisant, or the upper reaches of the Loire, um, which is Savi B country and Pinot Noir country uh, historically. Um, you can see Sauvignier, or you can see rather uh, a Sancerre here um, uh, in blue. Um, it is this uh, beautiful hilltop uh, village called, you know, kind of locally known as the King of the Hill. Um, and uh, it is closer to Burgundy uh, than it is uh, Angers. Uh, so uh, it is a much cooler climate that owes a lot more um, to uh, the kind of more central heart of, uh, of France than it does to the more kind of uh, maritime uh, inflected regions um, of the country. And uh, as such, um, you know, brings a brisk, cool wind um, to proceedings. Um, I promised that we would taste. I'm at 413, so I broke that promise. Um, I've been droning on for a solid 10 minutes, but we are going to taste here. I mean, I actually wrote down tasting notes um, for this one. I know um, that's something that um, sometimes I, I speed past and something that um, you all want, but I, I sat with these wines a little bit um, at first. And, um, you know, this is a wine, uh, it is planted, the vines are, are 30 uh, years old. Um, They're planted to um, uh, kind of uh, clay limestone soils and, and we'll uh, double back um, to um, the soil types here uh, in a second. But, um, you know, for the sake of my toast tasting notes here, um, you know, nothing feels quite so um, sophisticated as good Sancerre, which I think I really love about it. Um, it, you know, in the 60s and 70s, supplanted Chablis as the uh, bistro wine of choice in Parisian cafes and then spread from there throughout the world because everybody wants to drink like a Parisian. Um, but, you know, there is something just, you know, wonderfully pure um, about this wine. Um, I get a hint <coughs> of like jalapeno um, on the nose, a hint of green pepper, which is, you know, an innate characteristic of uh, Sabi B. Um, but, you know, there's a purity. Um, there's this ineffable minerality thing that wine nerds talk about all the time, um, which is this notion of chalkiness, um, which is this notion of, you know, what remains after, you know, water runs over, um, you, know, um, you know, rocks from the basement of time in a babbling brook. Um, and, you know, that's what this, you know, tastes like. You know, um, are, are washed clean, um, whatever they may be. 
um, for the sake of, of drinking this wine. Um, and, you know, on the palate, you know, it's, it's not austere, you know, it's, it's not shrill. Um, there is this wonderful orchard fruit um, that comes to the fore, this wonderful, you know, um, just ripe but not overripe uh, pear uh, quality to it, or some kind of bougie, you know, boutique um, apple um, that, you know, comes into the mix. And, you know, um, I love that uh, about it. Um, it is, um, this particular example, you know, exactly what I want out of Sancerre. You know, um, you know, for the sake of the Mike Steinbergers of the world, like, you know, is this a, a wine to pour over? Is it, you know, a life-altering wine, you know, that, you know, you're going to talk about, um, you know, uh, you know, decades hence? You know, maybe, maybe not, but does it give me exactly what I want on a 90-degree day to speak to, you know, Zoe's point earlier this week? You know, absolutely, uh, it, it does. Um, and, you know, for those of you um, that are drinking this wine, I encourage you to uh, throw in your own tasting notes here. I think something that Lover Jade does really well is they manipulate the leaves contact on this wine. So the leaves are the dead yeast, um, the, the particulate from the dead leaves left over after fermentation. They leave this wine in stainless steel. So there's a purity about it because it doesn't see any oak, um, but in contact with the leaves that impart a richness um, that it wouldn't have otherwise. Um, you know, there's just nothing wrong with that. You know, uh, it, it does, it, it, it feels, you know, um, it's like, you know, indulgences in a glass to get, you know, all Catholic uh, on you. You know, I, I feel like, you know, there is a, a, a sense of hope, um, you know, uh, embodied in it, uh, in a way. Um, and this is a wine that's all about terroir. So um, I name dropped um, limestone earlier. Um, limestone is much fetishized uh, in the world of wine. And Sancerre, um, you know, being almost exclusively devoted to Savi B, um, is uh, a, a wonderful place to explore this notion of terroir. So limestone um, is uh, calcium heavy um, rock. Um, it degrades into soils that are heavy in calcium carbonate. Um, in Sancerre, locally, there are uh, three predominant types. You have uh, terre blanc, um, and that would be the, what's called marl. Um, it's a, essentially a mudstone uh, that has somewhere between uh, 30 to 60% content worth of, of limestone. Um, and uh, it's soft, it's friable, breaks apart uh, readily, uh, which is good for the sake of vines because uh, they can sink their soils, uh, they can sink their roots uh, systems uh, very deep um, into uh, these soils. So, you know, with a lot of vineyards, you want, you know, poor soils and good drainage and hard rock. But if you get, you know, rock that is um, impermeable, then the, the root system has nowhere to go. And, and that's a bad thing. So, you know, this calcium, um, these calcium deposits in the form of limestone, they, you know, they, they give you, um, you know, this friable, this, this rock that breaks apart um, in a really auspicious uh, way. And, um, you know, this whole, um, you know, set of um, geologic formations uh, derived from ancient seabeds. So uh, it's very poetic. Uh, people think of Sancerre as a great wine with oysters. Essentially, we are drinking, um, you know, the remnants of an ancient oyster bed here um, uh, in the remains of the Paris Basin. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll get into specific geological era for the sake of the coyotes, but uh, Terre Blanc is, is a, essentially a, a, a mudstone. Um, it's one of the more predominant soils um, throughout uh, the region. Uh, Silex is a much harder, flintier uh, type of rock. Um, it tends to turn out wines that um, are more powerful, um, uh, predominates uh, in the kind of eastern um, uh, kind of uh, reaches of, of Sancerre and across the river in Puy Fume. It makes age-worthy Sauvignon Blanc. Um, truly age-worthy. Um, you know, some of the greatest wines of Didier uh, Dagenau, uh, for instance, who's one of the most famous uh, vineyards in this neck of the woods. Um, uh, some of those vineyards uh, planted to sea like soil. Um, it gives you kind of thicker skins and higher acid in your wines, um, which, you know, you want for something that will age well. And then coyote um, is, uh, you know, a, a type of soil that refers to um, a mix of these kind of rounded stones, uh, typically uh, derived from uh, either Kimmeridgean or uh, Portlandian limestone. Um, uh, you're dealing with geologic era here, um, uh, Portlandian uh, slightly older than Kimmeridgean, um, and this was this era of, um, you know, uh, central France at the bottom of a shallow sea, um, which gave us this wonderful limestone rock. Kimmeridgean uh, soil tends to be softer, uh, full of fossils, um, uh, and, um, you know, consistent um, with the way that, you know, geological deposits um, are laid for the sake of sedimentary rock uh, uh, higher on the hill uh, than um, the Portlandian, which are a little lower um, and, and harder uh, rock. Uh, tends to have, you know, fewer fossils um, and, you know, um, you know, gives you wines um, that are 
a little more structured um, and maybe a little less delicate um, than the Kimmeridgean soils. Uh, Kimmeridgean soils exist throughout um, France. They're uh, hugely lauded in such reasons as Champagne um, and Burgundy. Uh, limestone is much obsessed over um, uh, for a few reasons. Um, it is composed largely, limestone soil is composed of sheets of molecules held together by ionic bonds, which is to say uh, positive and negative charges attracting. Um, but uh, the soils have these wonderful properties um, that they retain water um, uh, in uh, drier um, conditions, uh, but they drain water in wetter conditions. And, and grapes are kind of, you know, the ultimate Goldilocks. They, they need a certain amount of water to thrive um, and properly exchange nutrients but not so much that they get their feet quote unquote wet. Um, and um, limestone soils, which are more basic, um, they are crucial for plant health. There's a lot of evidence to indicate that vines themselves are healthier on limestone soils. And then the wines um, tend to retain their acid better um, on limestone uh, than they do on other types um, of soil. So it has all of these benefits um, you know, that are well worth enumerating um, and um, much lauded um, and, you know, talked about to death um, uh, in the old world um, in a way that, you know, is, is worth, um, you know, emphasizing and, and considering. So uh, flash forward, um, we're going from uh, uh, the old world um, to uh, the new world here and New Zealand. Um, new Zealand um, is perched thousands of miles um, to um, the east of, uh, or a thousand miles, the east of, of Australia. Um, it's a big fucking island. I didn't realize just how big until, um, you know, I decided to give uh, this lesson. So um, you can see here, um, uh, transposed over the eastern United States, we we're stretching from beautiful Erie um, to Tallahassee. Um, I love that this map juxtaposes Erie and Tallahassee. Um, I feel like they should be sister cities. Um, I feel like they share a lot in common. Uh, I hope I'm not offending anyone tuning in from Tallahassee, but I feel like the Redneck Riviera has a lot in common with um, the shores of, um, you know, the Ohio Great Lakes. Um, but at any rate, you know, that is a huge spread. I um, mean, you know, think about that, you know, in terms of climate. Um, and uh, wine is made from the northern tip um, to almost the southern tip of uh, New Zealand. And New Zealand has uh, some of the most uh, southerly uh, vineyards in the world, uh, chiefly in the central Otago, which is um, uh, near uh, just kind of west of Dunedin uh, on uh, the South Island. Um, uh, grape growing winemaking came to um, New Zealand uh, with um, uh, some of the first English settlers. Uh, James Busby is kind of like the uh, Johnny Appleseed of uh, wine uh, for the sake of um, our friends in both uh, New Zealand and Australia. Um, he um, first made wine uh, in what is called the Northland. Um, we've got a North Island, we got a South Island in New Zealand. Uh, he planted vines in the Northland, which don't figure that prominently for the sake of modern New Zealand wine, but um, it was the first region, uh, you know, colonized uh, by the English uh, where grapes uh, were planted for the purpose of making wine. Uh, we're going to talk about Hawke's Bay, uh, which is this uh, yellow region here. Um, which is uh, equally old um, for the sake of uh, New Zealand wine. Um, and we have a historic property here founded in the 1890s, one of the oldest wineries uh, in New Zealand for the sake of this particular offering. But I want to talk about Marlborough uh, because Marlborough dominates um, New Zealand, um, just as Sauvignon Blanc constitutes the vast majority of plantings in New Zealand and dominates exports from New Zealand. Um, Marlborough didn't come to uh, public attention um, you know, didn't uh, enter um, international consciousness as a winemaking region um, until um, the 1970s, um, when uh, the Montana Wine Company uh, planted vineyards there. Um, but it should be said, they planted vineyards um, all the while they were doing their winemaking on the North Island. So um, the um, grapes they were growing had to be trucked across this treacherous Cook Strait um, to uh, wineries on the North Island. And much of, you know, what we think of as that, you know, ostentatious New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc style originally derived from the fact that during that, um, you know, 12 plus hour trip, um, the um, juice would leach from these grapes and, and you know, uh, the, the Kiwis unintentionally were essentially making Sauvignon Blanc as a, a, a lightly skin contact wine, um, which gave it, you know, this, you know, aromatic, um, you know, kind of ostentatiousness. Um, that, you know, is very different uh, from uh, the Sanceres of the world. Um, I think a really important thing to understand about 
um, New Zealand, for the sake of Marlborough, for the sake of Hawke's Bay, is that you're dealing with a cooler climate, but it's very unique because it's a cool, dry climate. Um, the Loire Valley is a cool climate region in the context of France, but it's wet. Um, you know, uh, they get quite a bit of rain. And as such, there's quite a bit of disease pressure, and the rains interfere with the slow ripening of the grape. And New Zealand, uh, or Sauvignon Blanc in general, is a grape that likes cooler climates and that, you know, prolonged growing season for the sake of developing its ripeness. Um, you're dealing with regions here that are among the few cool climate, dry growing regions in the world. There's a reason that there are no major growing regions on the western edge of New Zealand. Um, there are um, these uh, heavy prevailing winds that sweep off the sea uh, to the west that make viticulture virtually impossible there. Um, the spine of mountains that runs the, the length of New Zealand north to south uh, protects the vineyards of the east from that, but it also acts as a rain shadow. Um, so Hawke's Bay, Marlborough are much drier. Um, they're not totally dry because you're still dealing with the maritime climate, but they're much drier than they would be otherwise. And so what you're left with is this prolonged growing season and this incredible development of um, what we call phenolic ripeness in these grapes. And so physiologically, you're pushing ripeness to the extreme here um, with a grape like Sauvignon Blanc that pushed to the extreme develops all these fascinating uh, sets of flavors um, that, um, you know, love it or hate it, um, people have responded to and have become, you know, iconic uh, worldwide. So, um, you know, for me, um, these wines couldn't be uh, much different. Um, the Te Mata, um, you know, it is a little offensive, um, you know, um, uh, it, you know, is delightful in and of its own way. Um, what we're smelling here are chemical constituents called theols, um, which develop as the grapes ripen. There's been quite a bit of scientific inquiry into the physiology of taste, into the chemical constituents of New Zealand Sabi B, because it's such a great laboratory, because this is wine at 11, you know, because it's so expressive, because it leaps out of the glass, people have wanted to, you know, untangle that. And part of what they've untangled are um, methoxypyrazines. Um, those are those uh, bell pepper notes. Um, those tend to uh, disappear as the grapes ripen or disappear as the grapes are exposed to the sun during the ripening process. Uh, theols are kind of like a new inquiry. Um, there are um, uh, chemical constituents that develop during fermentation. Uh, they're not directly present in the grapes. Um, they um, develop out of the um, action of yeast on uh, chemical precursors in the grapes, fascinatingly enough. Um, there are three, and this is through the work of Mr. Jamie Good, who's uh, a friend of the class um, who was in on uh, the Riesling band camp that I organized last year and writes really fascinatingly about the subject if you're a huge wine nerd. But um, there are three different ones that he identifies. Um, one, you know, has this great fruity, passion fruity dimension for the sake of the wine. I definitely get that here. Um, one has more of a sweaty, overripe papaya kind of dimension. I get that here. And then the third, the dreaded Theol 4MMD, uh, gives you the intrinsic, um, confrontational, in your face, New Zealand uh, cat pee litter box uh, smell. Um, and I, I do get a little bit of that here. Um, you know, it's something that, you know, I think if you grew up with cats um, is, is inescapable. Um, but, you know, it's not, you know, poisonous uh, for the sake of uh, enjoying the wine. I think it's a very well-made wine. And it should be said that Hawke's Bay, um, being further north, being closer to the equator, um, the most privileged sites are north facing um, because they get longer exposure for the sake of the sun. Whereas, you know, in the Northern hemisphere, the privileged sites are south facing. Um, and that's the case here is a very well-made wine. The soils are very different than they are in Sancerre, tend to be much more alluvial. They tend to be much heavier, which gives you fuller um, ripeness um, on the grapes. And um, as the, the grapes ripen, it gives you a little less of that you know, um, you know, uh, kind of uh, consistent development of acidity. Um, but, you know, this is a 12 and a half percent alcohol wine that's loud as hell. You know, it goes to 11. Um, it's no shrinking violet, but in a, you know, wonderfully um, enjoyable way that's worth celebrating, but, you know, also, um, you know, really fun for the sake of kind of um, understanding what Sauvignon Blanc is all about um, for the sake of this two pack. Uh, Zoe, I've been talking for 30, 30 minutes straight. Um, what do you have uh, for me um, from uh, the uh, commentariat? These are the tasting notes, these are the questions about Saudi B. Kick it. Cool. Um, let's start with questions. Um, 
Lisa wanted to know uh, what areas of Sancerre to look out for for like younger uh, winemakers that are not so traditional and textbook. Um, uh, that that's hard. I mean, or do you have specific producers to call up? I I, do, I I there are quite a few. Um, you know, from what Alphonse Malo certainly we featured uh, Didier Jaganals across the river in Puy Fume. Um, I should have more off the uh, tip of my. I've, off the tip of my tongue, off the top of my head, having done this lesson, Zoe, but um, it's been supplanted by um, New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc information um, uh, and Bataan that makes a hugely iconic uh, Sancerre. Um, this is a map of, of Sancerre I meant to, to share earlier. Um, uh, and it's kind of cool because it, it identifies these different soil types. You can see that um, the Terre Blanc um, is predominant um, in uh, the Northwestern corner. Um, the Sancerre we're drinking is from Surrey Eval. Um, there's some really lovely um, younger producers there. Um, there's some fun natural winemakers there um, as well, which definitely would qualify, um, you know, for, for Lisa's sake um, as, as young guns. Um, further to the south, you get more of those Marley soils. And then most of the Silex um, you'll find um, in, the, in the east. There are 14 individual communes in Sancerre. They're not as important, um, you know, for the sake of the wines as uh, the villages of, of Burgundy. Um, Sancerre is very much, um, you know, about the winemaking establishment. Um, you know, this is a, a wine made from sustainable vineyards um, and the grapes are harvested by hand and it's very much an artisanal product. Um, you know, it should be said that that is sadly the exception to the rule. Um, uh, that is also the case in New Zealand, certainly the case for um, uh, Marlboro. Um, part of the reason uh, those wines are as affordable as they are is that um, in Marlboro, they can push the yields. They can make wine at 60, 70 you know, um, liters per hectoliter or hectoliters per, per acre or hectoliters per hectare of, of, of vines. Um, and they're machine harvesting anything, everything. It actually should be said that fascinating a lot, those, those theols um, that give you that like, you know, overripe tropical fruit and cap pea in the wine, um, they uh, are elevated in grapes that are machine harvested. So um, uh, they tend to be lower, 10 times lower in grapes that are hand harvested, which again tells you how dynamic and alive plants are. Um, it reminds me of, you know, slaughtering animals. And they say that, you know, if you traumatize an animal or scare an animal, you know, you, you taste that in the meat. Um, grapes work the same way. You traumatize the grapes, these theols are way higher. It just so happens that um, in New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, you know, um, people, you know, enjoy that, you know, um, you know, kind of strung out Sabi B flavor profile um, for whatever reason. Um, but, you know, there are artisanal producers in Sancerre as much as there are artisanal uh, producers in, um, in New Zealand. And, and I promise I'll follow up with a, a better uh, note to that effect. I tend to follow importers for this sake. So this comes from David Bowler, um, you know, certainly um, uh, Louis Dresner um, would, you know, have some really amazing wines worth, worth you know, sharing um, Kermit Lynch. Um, you know, a million other American importers who deal with smaller artisanal producers. But, um, you know, the bulk of production in Sancerre um, is, you know, um, mechanized uh, in, in a way that, you know, can produce like good wines, but, you know, um, perhaps not great wines that are truly expressive of the place. Um, you kind of uh, touched a little bit on this, but can you explain exactly why there's cat pee in Sauvignon Blanc? And is that just a um, a tribute to aging Sauvignon Blancs? Um, uh, so um, there is no actual, so I don't want to get angry letters from the, you know, wine tourism board of New Zealand. Um, this wine contains no actual cat pee. Um, it just happens to contain a chemical constituent, um, uh, which is called a theol. Um, for MMD uh, is, is one in particular. And that's an innate characteristic of the grape in these um, particular set of conditions such as they exist um, in, in New Zealand. Um, so, you know, it's this magic of, um, you know, flavor chemistry in this one corner of the world. And honestly, I think it's something that, you know, has always been intrinsic about the grape, but it took the Kiwis to tease out. Um, for, for better or worse. And, you know, this uh, evolving science of flavor in wines, it's so dynamic. So, you know, uh, take theols, you know, take um, uh, oxypyrazines. Um, you, you would think that if you raise or lower one, you know, the perception of cat pee, for instance, would be raise or lowered. But there are all these other chemicals that interact with 
um, you know, these other constituents in the wines that, you know, can have the effect of, you know, enhancing or dampening um, the chemical constituents at, at, at higher or lower concentrations. So everything is inter, interrelated and raising and lowering one thing can have all of these unintended, unintended consequences in this kind of like fabulous chaos theory kind of way um, that is just beginning. Uh, to be unraveled. And it just so happens that Sauvignon Blanc makes a really fascinating case in point for a study because it's such a loud wine, you know? Um, you wouldn't want to, you know, do this with Chablis. It doesn't, you know, speak as loudly. It would be a lot harder to, you know, tease out um, in a wine that wasn't as, as loud. Um, but, um, you know, that, that Cappy thing is just, you know, this grape in this place equals this chemical constituent that, you know, has this set of like associations for us. I have no idea, honestly, whether cat pee itself uh, contains that particular feel. I need to do deeper digging. I don't know if Jamie Good or any other wine personality has looked into the chemistry of, of cat pee uh, sufficiently. And I'm deeply sorry um, that we are um, discussing cat pee at, at such length. Um, I, I love cats. Uh, it, it, should, it should be it should be said, um, but uh, neither here nor there. Uh, Zoe, what else do you have for it? Um, could you talk a little bit of like why you would age a Sauvignon Blanc from Loire Valley, but you wouldn't necessarily want to lay down a New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc for 10, 15, 20 years? Yeah, um, excellent question. So uh, that would have everything to do with uh, the way the wine's made. Um, so part of the reason that, you know, those chemical constituents survive in these wines, theals in particular, is that the wines tend to be fermented in New Zealand at a much uh, lower temperature. So uh, these very expressive uh, chemical uh, constituents um, are very fragile um, as well, and they tend to break down during a warmer fermentation. Um, and in Sancerre, they tend to favor a slightly warmer uh, fermentation, or a slightly warmer temperature during fermentation, slightly more unregulated fermentation uh, 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 temp. Um, in New Zealand, um, they actually make way, like New Zealand, um, they, they make a, a ton of milk. Um, it's like a dairy industry, um, uh, trumps even wine to this day. Um, because of that, like they were innovators when it came to stainless steel tank design. Um, and so they're really good at making modern clean wine with very um, precise controls over fermentation temperatures. Um, uh, so um, they got really good at, at, at kind of preserving these chemical constituents, which tend to disappear very early on in the life of wine for the sake of months. Um, they disappear. Um, you know, I think uh, Sancerre, other, other good Loire Valley Sauvignon Blancs depend less um, on those fragile chemical constituents for their enjoyment. Um, you know, if you strip a New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc of its, you know, um, you know, grapefruit, you know, of its overripe papaya, you know, what's left? Um, whereas um, wine as it ages tends to lose that primary floral fruit characteristic and then leans more on savory textural characteristics. Um, you know, uh, those are, um, you know, still um, extant in Loire Valley wines in a way that, you know, makes them very age worthy. You know, that said, there are other people in New Zealand that are making wines, you know, that cut against the grain and that are, you know, age worthy in and of their, their own right. So it's important not to make gross like generalizations, but, um, you know, Savi B as it exists as a, a commercial product in New Zealand is meant to be enjoyed as a young wine, um, like open and shut case. It doesn't work otherwise. Absolutely. Um, can you explain the difference between giving the grapes stress and focus like we talked about a few weeks ago, but then also where this trauma comes in. Yeah, so I, I um, was listening to this, um, I was listening to Levy Dalton's uh, podcast, I'll drink to that, and he had uh, a winemaker um, from Sauvignon on, and um, people talk a lot about stressing grapes, um, and uh, the, wine, the French winemaker from Sauvignon took issue with that, and he said, you know, he thought about it like rearing children, and you know, for him, um, you know, the notion of, of vine health and vigor was not about stress. You know, you didn't want strung out preteen Morrissey grapes, um, you know, because, you know, you can listen to the Smiths for a while, you go through a phase, but, you know, if, if you overindulge, it becomes, you know, somewhat problematic, um, you know, but, you know, you do want to focus their energy. You don't want, you know, some you know, kind of laissez fair, you know, Rousseauian universe where the grapes can do whatever the fuck they want. You know, that makes for unfocused, uninteresting, diluted wine. It's like the rich kids of wine. They're handed everything, you know, they're not interesting individuals. Um, he talked about 
you know, ensuring health, providing for the plant, um, you know, much as limestone soils provide for Sancerre, but focusing their energy. Um, and, you know, I, I love that notion of uh, focus um, when it comes to viticulture, because I think at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. It's not about stress. Um, it is about focus. And, and that, that means cheaply limiting yields, um, which is something that doesn't happen um, in mass marketed New Zealand wines, but does happen for the sake of the wines that we're, we're drinking today. Awesome. Um, can you talk a little bit about the de-evolution of Cloudy Bay? We have a uh, listener who used to love it about 10 years ago, and now it's, um, it's quite Great rough. point. Um, the de-evolution has everything to do with the commodifi commodification of wine under lux luxury brands. So Cloudy Bay was um, the first uh, successful mass marketed um, uh, New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc. And it, it was a really good wine um, for what it was in Marlborough once upon a time. Uh, enter, um, you know, transnational corporations. And um, they just, you know, screw everything up. Um, you know, that is true in New Zealand. That is true in every corner of the globe, that's not a uniquely American uh, phenomenon. That is a global phenomenon. So Cloudy Bay was purchased by um, Moet Hennessy um, and Louis Vuitton, who um, also purchased a number of champagne houses, who they also fucked up. Um, and uh, they went from making a wine to making a reliable commodity at scale. Um, and, you know, that's what went awry. Um, so, you know, wine is an agricultural product to make a good wine, you have to treat it as an agricultural product. Um, to the extent that you're more worried about a brand image or maintaining an unattainable, um, you know, kind of consistency across vintages, um, you're gonna debase um, what was once a good thing. Awesome. Um, I think I wanna let you talk about the green glow and the natural. Great. Yeah, so um, this, is, this is really fun. I think, you know, New Zealand, New Zealand has, has suffered a bit from its success for the sake of um, it's Sauvignon Blanc um, in the sense that, you know, um, people associate it with, you know, particular subspecies of wines. And there's so much more going on there. Um, you know, I think on the ground, um, every wine scene is just much more dynamic um, than you would imagine, um, you know, from the outside looking in. I, I think that's, you know, that's true not only of wine, but, you know, of life in general. So, um, you know, it's always important not to make gross generalizations. And um, I wanted to feature these wines for the sake of this lesson, just to, you know, show some outliers, to show, you know, what people are doing with this cliche of Sauvignon Blanc in kind of a different way. Um, and these are two producers from the North Island. We have Hawks Bay again, um, uh, for the sake of the supernatural. Um, and uh, we have Cambridge Road, uh, which is from a little further south. Um, you're dealing with the um, kind of southern end of the North Island for the sake of Cambridge Road. Um, and you have two um, producers working biodynamically. Um, so uh, they are committed to um, the vineyard as a self-sustaining entity um, in this quasi-mystical, you know, kind of um, almost religious um, parlance that goes uh, above and beyond normal or organic viticulture. And then um, they are committed to this notion of Sauvignon Blanc on the skins. So um, I think uh, this whole notion of, you know, quote, unquote, orange wine, um, which is um, wine made from white grapes, but raised on the skins, um, has become a bit of a hipster sommelier cliche. And, and I apologize, um, you know, for perpetuating that. You know, I deserve as much of the blame as other hipster sommeliers. I just don't have the tattoos for it. Um, you know, uh, but I think, you know, for, for those of us that like it as a winemaking technique, what that skin contact gives you is this like added um, uh, kind of uh, tool to play with in your winemaking arsenal. And um, Sauvignon Blanc is, is a, is a, in a cooler climate is a high acid grape. Um, uh, and giving it time on the skins um, actually dampens that acidity. So um, grape skin is very high in potassium um, and that tends to dampen the acidity in wine and raise the pH of the resultant wine. Um, and also you get all of these, you know, um, we're talking a lot about grape chemistry, but you get all of these chemical signifiers um, that really lurk in the skins. Um, you know, a lot of the most interesting things about the flavor of a wine are in the skins. That's why red wine is as delicious as it is. The color comes from the red grapes. You know, if you pressed off most red grapes, you would get, you know, clear wine. You know, the good stuff is in, is in the skins. Um, and, you know, so um, leaving a white wine on the skins, um, you know, makes a whole hell of a lot of sense, especially if you're working in a non-interventionist modality, because a lot of the preservatives 
that allow you to work with less sulfur, which is a hugely important preservative in wine. Um, those exist in the grape skins as well. So um, uh, uh, we have two wines here. Uh, we're gonna taste the, the green glow first. Um, so this label uh, glows in the dark. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna try something fun for those of you at home. Wait for it, Zoe. Ooh, <laughs> I don't know. Oh, we can't. I can't see it. it. Doesn't. It doesn't work. Boo. Oh, that was. That was. That was my big reveal for those of you at home. Um, uh, it should glow in the dark. Um, wah wah. Um, uh, and actually, so the winemaker here is uh, Hayden Penny. He's a young guy, as you might imagine. Um, he takes his cues from. Um, beer, um, the beer industry, he, he thinks that like winemaking labels are kind of stodgy and not fun. Um, so um, he takes his cues from uh, the beer world, which I think shows, um, you know, for the sake of his labels. Um, and he's devoted, uh, you know, uh, himself to working with white grapes on the skins. Um, uh, this is Sauvignon Blanc on the skins for two to three weeks. Um, and, um, you know, it goes to 11. Um, uh, and, you know, I think what's really cool about it is texture. So it sees additional time on the lees, which you talked about for the sake of the Sancerre. It sees even more time on the lees. Um, and it has this wonderful richness about it, um, which, you know, is fabulous um, with the right food. Um, but then it has this, like, you know, ultraviolet intensity for the sake of those tropical flavors um, that, you know, you just want to lean into um, and, and have fun with. Um, and, you know, it's a good exuberance. And there's no, there's no litter box in sight with this wine. You know, it's all tropical um, in a really cool way. And then, you know, the textural piece um, is so cool. And that's something that both these wines share in common. And then the naturalist is equal parts Savi B and Pinot Gris. Um, and uh, this one's from uh, Martinboro Terrace. Um, kind of comparable soils for the sake of, of Hawks Bay. You know, for the sake of both regions, you're dealing with kind of alluvial, pl alluvial flood plains. Um, uh, descending into the Pacific. Um, uh, again, kind of heavier soils, but um, you, you tend to move away from uh, the ocean and, and, and higher up on a series of terraces for the um, better vineyard sites. Um, and that's true here um, uh, as well. And um, this was New Zealand's first pet nat. So the green glow was like New Zealand's first Savi B on the skins. Cambridge Road, the naturalist was very much New Zealand's first pet nat. Um, for those of you um, unfamiliar with pet nat, um, uh, is shortened form of Petion Natural. Um, it is made in what's called the Method Ancestral, which is a different way of making a sparkling wine than is typically practiced in Champagne. You're dealing with one continuous fermentation. Basically, you bottle the wine early or seal it with a crown cap early before the fermentation is finished. Um, there's leftover yeast and sugar in the bottle. It finishes fermentation under pressure and you're left with this delicate little bead. Um, this is unfined and unfiltered and super cider-like. Um, uh, this one, you know, is less recognizable as New Zealand Savi B. Um, you know, the fact that it's bottled without sulfur, the fact that it's on the skins and has this cloudy, um, you know, unfiltered, um, you know, dimension to it. Um, you know, I think that tends to erode varietal character. It tends to erode, you know, what the French call tipicité. You know, it tends to, you know, steer things in this, like, more kind of ubiquitous natural wine direction. But, you know, for the sake of this wine, I think it's a fun place to go. Um, and, you know, I really dig that about it. And then I love, for the sake of Pet Nat, that lighter bead. You know, you know, champagne bottle that, you know, six, seven atmospheres worth of pressure, you know, could be a little aggro. Um, CO2, um, you know, it is, is, you know, it kind of takes over the party sometimes um, uh, for the sake of, of champagne. This is, you know, kind of like more playful, more delicate in, in a really fun way. And, and I think Pet Nat is a really fun, like, gastronomic uh, wine that way. But you know, these are both great signposts um, for the sake of what's happening in New Zealand um, for, you know, smaller producers that are, you know, bucking the image of New Zealand as a source of, of supermarket, you know, Kim Crawford, um, you know, kinds of wine. Um, it should be said that uh, I know a lot of people commented on the crown caps um, or bottle caps um, and uh, the screw top um, for uh, the Temata. 99% of New Zealand wines are bottled without a cork. Um, they're very forward thinking when it comes to that. Um, both a screw cap and um, a, a, uh, um, a, a bottle cap are actually less oxygen transmissive than cork. Uh, cork is much more permeable. Um, cork can also poison the wine um, uh, for the sake of cork taint. Um, and uh, the Kiwis, very modern, very forward thinking, um, almost have universally eradicated uh, cork as a closure. Um, for the sake of their wines, for better or worse. Um, but um, uh, you'd be hard pressed to find a New Zealand wine, whatever it is, whether it's, you know, a more serious 
Pino meant to lay down for decades or, you know, Kim Crawford. Um, that doesn't have a, a screw cap. But um, I think these are, are both, you know, super fun, you know, kind of alien wines um, that, you know, for those of you that think you know New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc kind of, um, you know, force you to, to reevaluate in a pleasant way. Um, Zoe, any questions about this or New Zealand uh, at large? Yeah, absolutely. What is the difference between the North and the South Island? Um, you know, one's North, one's South, um, uh, which is the most, you know, facile answer I've ever given. And, and it made me sound like a huge asshole. And I apologize to the questioner um, uh, in advance. Um, you know, I, I wish I was more expert um, when it came to uh, the geography of New Zealand. Um, you know, as you move further away from the equator, obviously you um, uh, get um, cooler uh, temperatures for the sake of the wines. Um, the North Island of New Zealand is much more populous. Historically, more of the vineyard facilities um, were there. Um, uh, the South Island is, is kind of like newer on the scene um, as the source of fine wines. Um, you know, I think it's hard to make gross generalizations from one place to the next in New Zealand um, about the North and the South Island. I would say, you know, most of the, you know, major growing regions on the North Island are a little warmer. Um, so Hawke's Bay is actually famous for Bordeaux blends. Um, so it produces the bulk of, uh, um, you know, kind of prestige red wines in New Zealand. Uh, you don't really see any of that in Marlboro. Um, you do see some of that in um, or uh, a good deal of it um, on the South Island, but that's in the central Otago, um, which is kind of further inland and, and more of a continental climate. Um, but um, you see some Chardonnay um, on the North Island as well. Um, but, you know, you know, by and large tends to be a little warmer, um, uh, you know, than the South Island. But, you know, there's always an exception to the rule, um, you know, from one corner of the country to the next. And, um, you know, again, I'm, I'm, no, I'm no New Zealand uh, expert. You, you sell yourself short. Um, can you talk a little bit more about this um, very complex and seems very tense relationship of Savi B and Oak? And um, what the fuck is um, is uh, our American version of Fumé Blanc? Yes, that is a perfect segue, Zoe. Um, thank you to the questioner. So um, lest we forget, um, we have a couple domestic wines uh, in the mix here. Um, and um, a few things. So I think, you know, Savi B has developed this uh, relationship with uh, oak, you know, whereby I think the prevailing style is unoaked. Um, but I don't think the prevailing, I can tell you, you know, um, you know, in terms of market data, the prevailing side style is, you know, whistle clean, unoaked, um, doesn't go through mallow, you know, is a young wine meant to be, you know, consumed within the current vintage, um, you know, here today, gone tomorrow, um, you know, alcoholic lemonade. Um, but um, it, it can take on oak really well. Um, you know, I find uh, with Sauvignon Blanc, uh, it, it can be hard to work with for the sake of oak. Sometimes, uh, and, and oak is a fascinating variable when it comes to winemaking, you know, um, you have to find grapes that can wear oak well. Um, you know, uh, in the context of our, our last lesson, I talked about my own fashion sense and, you know, having to you know, lean into, you know, classic tailoring as opposed to, you know, really, you know, more, you know, fun, you know, zoot suits and stuff like that. Um, you know, um, I think Sauvignon Blanc is a grape that typically needs more classic styling. Um, it's not a um, Merlot, um, for instance, or a Zin that, you know, can wear whatever it wants. Um, but there are exceptions. And I think, you know, for me, the best um, exception to that rule um, would be Bordeaux Blanc. Um, and, and I think uh, largely that's because Bordeaux Blanc also sees this uh, balancing influence of uh, Semillon, um, which is this weightier, kind of waxier wine that, you know, is a perfect yin for me to Sauvignon Blanc's uh, yang. And, and I really like that relationship and wish people would drink more Bordeaux Blanc because um, it, it can be really stunning uh, uh, wine. Um, and, and it does take on oak really beautifully and historically sees um, oak um, almost with, without um, exception, the greatest port of Blancs do. Um, uh, so I would like to see more of that. Um, in California, you have seen, uh, in, in the New World more broadly, um, you have seen producers, um, you know, play with that more. Uh, Mary Edwards would be the, the, you know, kind of one of the premier exponents 
um, and, and we're selling uh, her wine. Um, it's funny, Jill came to me and she was like, you know, I can't believe you brought in the Mary Edwards. And, you know, um, yes, you know, that is available everywhere. And, you know, it's a bit of a cliche as such, you know, for, for certain wine drinkers. But, you know, I think it's important to celebrate icons um, and touchstones where they exist. And uh, Mary's been in the game for over four decades. Um, she deserves huge credit for putting the Russian River Valley on the map for the sake of three grapes, Pinot, Chard, and Savi B. I mean, that's, you know, you know, one of those contributions is worth a lifetime worth of, of, of work as a vigneron. And, um, you know, she's done, she's done it all. And, you know, I, I think sometimes people in my position, you know, we, you know, lean into that, you know, kind of high fidelity, you know, jazz record store, you know, this person doesn't deserve this, you know, rare record, um, you know, kind of elitism. And, um, you know, it's equally important to celebrate the, tra the trailblazers, the pioneers, the, you know, and, and you know, um, Mary Edwards makes a great wine. You know, it is not you know, a natural wine, you know, it's very different than what Cambridge Road is doing, um, you know, for the sake of, of their wines. But, you know, I think it's nonetheless worthwhile um, in a really cool way. Um, but, um, you know, circling back to that question um, about um, Sauvignon Blanc in California, um, it was first planted in the Livermore Valley in the mid 1800s, or in the mid, in the mid 1800s. Um, uh, I don't think people fully appreciate the extent to which California had this massive wine industry before prohibition. So a lot of the people that came out West to make a fortune um, in the gold rush uh, fell flat. Um, the really smart ones opened general stores and they made all the money. Um, just like I think in the restaurant industry, the really smart people are the one that sell me like glassware and designer restaurants. Like I'm the idiot. I'm the one panning for gold. But, um, you know, at any day, at any rate, like um, Charles Whitmore, um, uh, he is a newspaperman. Uh, so he's kind of like a Mark Twain figure turned winemaker. And uh, he helmed um, the, the California uh, Viticultural Commission, um, which he established, helped establish. And he took uh, cuttings from Chateau du Kim, um, uh, which makes uh, Sauterne, uh, in which uh, Sauvignon Blanc plays a, a smaller uh, part. Semillon is a star player, but uh, Sauvignon Blanc is, is a, a important um, uh, supporting player um, in those wines. And um, he uh, introduced it to California and established its name. Um, sadly, under the name uh, Sauterne, um, uh, just like under the name Chablis, um, you know, uh, it was a bulk wine. It was like sold in a, a jug and, you know, um, you saw, you know, um, people drinking it straight out of the jug. Um, and it bore little resemblance to the Sauvignon Blanc we know today. And it was, it tended to be sweet. Um, typically, it was more of like a mad dog, 40-40 um, kind of fortified situation. But um, leave it to Robert Mondavi, um, another California OG who deserves more credit than he, um, you know, commonly gets, um, uh, to save uh, Sauvignon Blanc from bulk wine status. He pivoted. He said, you know, we have this Sauvignon Blanc. People associate with the bulk wine. How do we pivot? Um, how do we rebrand? And he uh, recognized uh, Puy Fume as a useful um, you know, antecedent. Uh, fume means smoke, essentially, in, in, in French. And he took that word and he said, you know, let's rebrand here. Let's call it Fume Blanc. We're not making, you know, Sauvignon Blanc or, or jug wine sans, like Sauterne. We're making Fume Blanc. It's a, a luxury product. And um, uh, he did that, um, you know, beginning in the 60s and 70s and reestablished uh, Sauvignon Blanc as a worthwhile grape. Um, in California. Um, and uh, his uh, Tocolon vineyard um, uh, has vineyards planted in 1949 uh, for Sauvignon Blanc, which are some of the oldest in California um, to this day. Um, uh, we're celebrating um, a Savi B um, here um, uh, for the sake of uh, wine for class. Um, and uh, hails from Doug Marjoram, uh, who is a pioneering uh, winemaker in the central coast of California um, from Santa Barbara. So um, if you've seen Sideways, um, you know Santa Barbara. Um, they weren't in Napa. Um, they were in Santa Barbara because they were coming from uh, L.A. And the Hitching Post is a, a, a hugely lauded, um, uh, you know, kind of winemaker hangout um, in that corner of the world. Um, it's cartoonishly beautiful, um, especially set to, you know, that cool jazz score. Um, and um, they work with some really awesome grapes. Uh, it's a much cooler climate than people associate with California. So um, you are... Uh, along the Pacific coast and much as Hawke's Bay 
um, in Marlborough in New Zealand have a maritime influence. Uh, Santa Barbara and these other Central Coast vineyards in California have a maritime influence. So um, you have the Humboldt Current, the California Current, which sweeps up from the south and uh, makes the vineyards of Santa Barbara, you know, 10 degrees cooler than it would be on the Napa Valley floor uh, at the height of summer. And so that you can grow a grape like Sauvignon Blanc that thrives in a cooler environment um, and do it justice. And um, this marjoram is bottled at 12, um, under 12 and a half percent alcohol, which is a minor miracle. Um, and it's a really fabulous wine. Um, uh, so Doug Marjoram um, is a, a sommelier by training. Um, he for, uh, featured the work of, um, you know, some of the pioneering uh, viticulturalists in Santa Barbara throughout the 80s and 90s at his restaurant and then became a winemaker, um, you know, himself. Um, and uh, Marjoram, obviously, uh, his uh, private uh, label um, for the sake of this wine. He's one of the Rhone Rangers, so um, he has uh, championed uh, uh, grapes from uh, the Rhone Valley of France um, as, um, you know, being favorable for California, but um, he uh, equally uh, celebrates Savi B. And I, I just think this is a really lovely wine. Um, it tastes, um, you know, fuller fruited than the Sauvignon, or than the, than the Sancerre, rather. Um, but it, it kind of avoids those, um, uh, you know, unfortunate excesses that you get out of New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc sometimes. And, you know, I, I think that's really um, what we're celebrating. And then um, the East Coast um, side of the ledger comes from a good friend of the restaurant, um, Mr. Jim Law. Um, we love Jim to death. Uh, Linden is a place name. Uh, Jim is very much um, the... Um, uh, father figure uh, for the sake of those of us that love Virginia wine. He was making serious wine out of Virginia before anybody else. Um, he took a, a former apple orchard and made it um, one of the great uh, wineries on the East Coast. And um, he uh, is singularly devoted to understanding what Virginia has to offer and establishing this notion of terroir, of growing this notion of terroir, this sense of place um, that takes time to unravel, that takes time to develop and, and fully discover. Um, and that's what he's all about. And, and what he says about this Sauvignon Blanc, which comes from um, uh, the foothills of the Blue Ridge, a, a site that is farmed by his partner, Sherry Vinius, and named for her. Um, he says, terroir trumps bridal. Um, ironically, this is well higher uh, in ABV than the marjoram. Um, so kind of a, an inversion of roles, East Coast to West Coast. Um, but there's a purity to it um, that is, is, is worthy uh, of the old world. Um, and, you know, um, it's, it's a great example um, uh, of this wine. And, you know, I think for everyone that, um, you know, kind of poo-poo's um, Virginia wine, I hope that, you know, um, you know, A, you know, you're giving this a try and, and you do like it. And B, that, um, you know, when, uh, the world allows that you visit Linden because it is a really magical place and um, uh, Jim is a, 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 a really uh, lovely uh, human being um, and you know the more business we send his way um, you know the, the, the better I'll feel uh, about myself so um, you know that's that's the new world uh, you know kind of or that's the, rather the the, the American uh, Savi B scene um, but you know it is fascinating uh, the extent to which Savi B um, has you know really succeeded um, as a brand um, uh, that owes everything to uh, New Zealand, but um, it's taken on a life of its own, um, you know, beyond, um, you know, uh, Kiwi Savi B. We tasted a, a South African Savi B um, uh, last week, um, you know, that, uh, you know, has become a brand in of itself, Chilean Savi B, um, Northern Italian Savi it's, it's it's everywhere. And, you know, it has a really strong varietal imprint, as does Cabinot, as, as does Cap Sauv, um, you know, in a, in a way that, you know, um, can express a sense of place, but, you know, also is reliable um, from one corner of the world to the next. Um, what you got, so? I have some more questions about cat pee and wine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, all right, before we get to that, I, I, I want to, I want to, I want to toast it out just for the sake of uh, those of you uh, participating from home and give you a license to go on with your lives if, you, if you'd like to. Um, thank you so much uh, for, for joining us today. Um, you know, uh, again, I want to circle back to this notion of, of guilty pleasures. Uh, there should be none. You know, I think a pandemic, treat, uh, you know, ongoing pandemic theme uh, is, is treat yourself, um, you know, whatever, um, you know, treats you enjoy. Um, and when it comes to wine, you know, the world is full of wine experts that will tell you what 
uh, to like, what not to like, um, you know, please uh, disregard them. Um, enjoy the ride. Find out for yourself. Drink out of a solo cup on ice like man if you want to. You know, drink all the Kim Crawford in the world if that's what floats your boat. You know, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you know, if you're living in the mystery, you know, and celebrating wine as a sustainable and agricultural product, um, you know, then, um, you know, uh, the rest uh, is gravy. So uh, thank you for joining us as always, uh, alone, together. Cheers. Uh, so, Cat Pete, hit me. Yeah, so does it dissipate with further bottle age, kind of like some of the uh, like, beards do? Yeah, it would actually. Um, uh, the chemical constituents absolutely would. Um, I kind of want to run that experiment. I, I kind of want to. So I actually, I have this like huge weakness for aging wines that people don't think of as ageable. One of my favorite wines that we've served uh, at Chale Up Goat was actually this 2006 Pinot Noir Rosé from Herman Beamer. Um, A, nobody thinks about aging rosé. B, nobody thinks about aging um, Finger Lakes wine. C, nobody thinks about aging rosé from the Finger Lakes. And we doubled down on it. And it was like stunning. Um, it wasn't recognizable as its younger self at all, but it had this like, you know, saline, you know, savoriness that was just seductive and amazing. Um, you know, so I want to run that experiment. I kind of want to throw down, you know, you know, a, a Kim Crawford vertical, um, you know, just for shits and giggles, um, just to see what happens. Um, but I would imagine uh, that the cat pee thing would wane um, and you would be left with, um, an insipid wine that you would, you know, not enjoy older, um, you know, but, you know, I'm, I'm willing um, to be wrong. You know, I'm willing uh, to, you know, be exposed as a charlatan and, you know, um, realize that Kim Crawford is one of the world's most age-worthy wines. What else you got? Um, what other varietals act like that other than Savi B? Great question. Um, uh, Gewürztraminer. Um, uh, so Gewürz is uh, 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 genetically linked to Sauvignon. Uh, that's a a, a, a uh, um, of, it has a, a parent offspring relationship with Sauvignon Blanc, uh, but uh, the bulk of evidence indicates that it's, it's the parent of Sauvignon Blanc. Um, but Gewürz um, is is loud. Gewürz is actually even louder than um, uh, Sauvignon Blanc. Gewürz is like um, you know. Um, spraying your sister with the fragrances at the department store, you know, um, for fun. Um, it's it's a it's a, a huge uh, wine. Um, uh, so I, I think Gewurz is, is is a logical one. Um, uh, Gewurz actually ages really well in this like beguiling way. Um, it loses this like rose petal like floral ostentation that it hasn't used, and then takes on this like textural weirdness that. Um, you know, it was kind of like oolong, you know, kind of uh, orange, orange, uh, like pico tea kind of thing that, that I think is, is really seductive. Um, maybe it's not a wine that you just like throw black reflexively on a patio, but um, it's fun nonetheless. I think in terms of other varietals that are famously aromatic, um, the Malvasia Moscato family, I think is a little bit like that. Um, honestly, the Riesling family. Uh, can be like that. And, and Riesling, you know, as much as I love it, can be similarly divisive, um, you know, um, in terms of like, you know, how it, how it uh, expresses and, and shows uh, for people. Um, you know, vis-a-vis -vis like that, like cat pee uh, signifier specifically, I can't really think of another grape that, that has that, like Cab Franc and um, Cab Sauv will get green. Um, people say green, they'll have that like asparagus kind of artichoke um, uh, thing going on um, when underripe. Um, but, you know, um, it's something that Savi B, um, you know, really kind of um, carries the banner for. Um, one of my final questions of what about it in the pit nap process um, makes the wines just so cloudy, um, that being like unfined and filtered or being bottled with the leaves? Yeah, so that has an action. Like, that honestly has nothing to do with the process of introducing gas to the wine, it has more to do with the finishing of the wine. So, um, you know, most wines, especially white wines um, that are uh, sold commercially are um, either fined or filtered. 
Um, and that's just about stability. Um, Sauvignon Blanc typically doesn't go through what's called malolactic fermentation. Um, and for wines that don't go through that, you know, kind of secondary phase of the fermentation process, it's necessary to either add sulfur or filter them. Otherwise, they tend to re-ferment um, in the bottle um, if you're not careful. Um, and, uh, you know, um, on top of that, sparkling wine, because it um, whether you're making wine like Champagne or, or in the Method Ancestral um, undergoes this, a, a fermentation process in the bottle itself. Um, typically people uh, find a way to expel um, that leftover sediment. Um, so um, they'll um, kind of carry out this process. Uh, it's called rumage, whereby they, you know, slowly but surely turn the bottle and work um, that sediment into the neck um, and then uh, plunge it in ice bath, freeze, um, pop the cork, expel, and you're left with something that's a lot cleaner and clearer than it would be otherwise. Um, Cambridge Road um, being devoted to, you know, natural um, methods and, you know, no additives um, from vineyard to bottle, um, you know, issues that. And, and they, they think that, you know, the wine as a living being on those leftover leaves is a big part of the enjoyment of the wine. Um, you know, I will say from personal experience that wines that are bottled, especially sparkling wines that are bottled with the lees like that, um, you know, they tend to be uh, wines of process, um, I think, more than they want are wines of place. Um, uh, I think uh, the Cambridge Roads of the world would, would disagree with me, but I think in terms of, you know, um, the way that they express, especially if you poured them side by side in a blind tasting context, um, you know, they lean into that cider like, you know, sour beer like um, place. And, you know, they all kind of all roads converge. And it doesn't matter whether you're working with Sauvignon Blanc or Pinot Gris or Gerberstraminer or, you know, any other number of white grapes, you know, they're going to land in that place that tastes like lees and tastes like unfiltered natural wine. And that's just where they converge. And that can be an enjoyable, an, like an enjoyable place to live. But part of my frustration with like the natural wine community is they want to pretend that, you know, um, that convergence doesn't happen. They want to pretend that, you know, that convergence is a true expression of Sauvignon Blanc. And for me, you know, I think a truer expression of Sauvignon Blanc, you know, maybe God forbid is a wine that sees a little bit of sulfur. Uh, last question for you. Um, talking about New Zealand wines and the Maori um, indigenous people, how they don't have too many wineries, um, but are there any that you specifically suggest or if there's just um, any knowledge drop that you want to talk about? Yeah, that's that's an amazing, amazing question. Um, Te Mata uh, refers to a, a peak and obviously is a Maori term. Um, the estate um, actually endowed um, the New Zealand Poet Laureate Prize. So the news all like, and this is in the 90s. So, you know, the Poet Laureates of New Zealand, um, they actually get this traditional Maori walking staff carved um, by the vignerons at um, uh, Te Mata. Of course, the winery is owned by a bunch of people that look like me originally from Northern Ireland. Um, uh, I, I don't know. I, I, that's a that's a really good question, and I wish I'd done more digging for the sake of this lesson. Honestly, I think you know that question of um, you know minority representation in the wine world is one that you know should always be at the front of our mind, regardless of the lesson. Um, and um, you know, James Busby didn't you know he didn't enter Terra Incognita. You know, there were you know he didn't plant vines on the North Island. Um, you know, uh, in a vacuum. Um, he wasn't the first person to discover um, New Zealand. You know, there were, um, you know, uh, indigenous uh, occupants and New Zealand history certainly doesn't start with him, um, even though um, Western winemaking history does. Um, I, I'd love to do, I'd love to do more digging. And, and you know, I thank the questioner um, for, for asking as much. Um, uh, I should be said that like, um, I love the Kiwi sense of, of humor uh, and Te Oakiki, uh, Oatiti, uh, uh, who, um, uh, is behind, um, you know, a series of vampire flicks and uh, other, you know, New Zealand expressions of culture. And then, you know, um, you know, uh, Jermaine Pinot, uh, who's behind the Flight of the Concords, they both have, um, you know, uh, indigenous ancestry in New Zealand. Um, so there's definitely like, you know, uh, indigenous representation uh, there uh, in pop culture. And, and I'd love to uh, explore that further uh, for the sake of the wines. But 
um, you know, in as much as I live along the Potomac River, um, but there are no um, Aboriginal, um, you know, occupants of, um, you know, the Potomac tribe uh, in DC. Um, Te Mata bears a name that, you know, doesn't necessarily uh, have a lot to do with uh, the people that do the winemaking mill. That's all I got. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it feels like a bit of a, you know, that's a, that's a tough note to end on, but, you know, a worthwhile one uh, at any rate. Um, we can uh, ask a question about cat pee. We can just well, like... People, no, I think we, 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 that, we, we, we... That horse is dead, Zoe. Um, <laughs> uh, it, should said, it should be said that, like, we had a lot of questions about uh, slutty as a wine descriptor. And, and Zoe, that was your... That was your descriptor. So I'm going to put you on the spot. I, I have used that vis-a-vis uh, -vis wines before. Um, why did you say slutty when it came to Sauvignon Blanc for the sake of uh, summer wine enjoyment? I'm going to try to use my words so diplomatically right now. <laughs> so diplomatically. Do not want nasty emails. Um, you know, I guess with great communication and if you're an open, honest relationship, I guess being slutty isn't a bad idea maybe that's the same exact thing that you can talk about wine with yeah exactly i think i think too I, I think i think like uh this comes from like at tail up goat wine school i think we we are this is a sex positive wine school uh there's no slut shaming here i think we want to speak in terms of forward wines and you know we have all been we've all had that moment in our lives you know where you know, that little bit of, you know, sluttiness has served us well and, um, you know, been, been fun, um, you know, God forbid. Um, and I think we all need a little bit of that uh, in, in our lives uh, right now. So I, I think that's, that's important to, to celebrate. It is a, it's a human uh, tendency. It is a wine tendency. And, you know, I, I, for me, it just connotes, you know, a wine that's, that's bored, you know, wine that gives it all up you know, on the first date, a wine that, you know, you don't even have to stick your nose in the glass to readily identify. It, you know, comes for you. Um, and, you know, that that is, um, you know, equally, equally worth celebrating. So um, cheers to that. Cheers to you, Zoe, uh, as always. Cheers to you, all of you uh, joining us from home. Have a lovely week. I love you all.